Good morning, good afternoon, and possibly good evening. This is Alvin Taveras, your Southwest Florida Realtor, and I have a very special guest in the building. We have Jeff Tamarillo, and you do so many things within Southwest Florida. You're a broker for uh, Steelbridge Realty. You are also the founder and president of Southwest Florida RIA. I guess, Jeff, to get the ball rolling, can you talk to us a little bit about the Southwest Florida RIA? Um, who tends to enjoin and what are some of the benefits that they receive? Well, it's a pretty eclectic membership uh, all across the board. Uh, irony is it, it was a bunch of us were having lunch in August of 04 and thought it would be fun to have a club here like they do in Dade and Broward because we used to drive over for those meetings. And uh, so that's how we uh, uh, kind of came up with the idea. Our first meeting, I think it was November of 04. We've been meeting ever since. That's 16 years ago. It's hard to believe. Right. Uh, it's really just a big mastermind collaboration. We have meetings. Uh, because of the pandemic, we're doing Zoom meetings. We're probably going to go back to physical meetings again pretty quick. We will maintain the Zoom component. Uh, if you're interested, just go to the website, swflreia.com. Right. And I should mention that I am a member. That's how we met through the Southwest Florida RIA. It's a great way to meet lenders, meet other uh, realtors, find out who's doing business in the region. And it's a really great way to connect overall. Now, one of the two things, one of the things that we have in common is that we're both very active in Cape Coral. You do a great deal of land acquisition and land development. Can you talk to us about what makes Cape Coral special from a land acquisition perspective? Well, on the land side, it's interesting because you've got really three basic types of lots in residential, which is dry, saltwater, freshwater. Yep. You've got the modality of, uh, of assessments. And then each location in the Cape <clears throat> has a very specific use. Like if you're a boater, Southeast, Southwest Cape's amazing. Yep. If you're a fisherman, you're really, Northwest Cape's a little better because you can get to Pine Island Sound. Uh, the freshwater canals are cool and there's some that you can put a power boat in. There's some you can't. Yep. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. The nice thing about a canal is, is you don't really have a neighbor to the rear. Like I live on a canal in North Fort Myers. We're six houses off the river. Right. And it puts the neighbor far enough away that it's kind of like not really having a neighbor. It's somebody you wave to from about a half a block away. So it's kind of, it gives you a little more privacy living on a canal. And it's really a kind of a planned community where they dug all these canals. I mean, the right. irony is back in the 50s, everybody in Lee County was laughing at these crazy guys from New Jersey that were paying people to run bulldozers and dig canals. And now it's, you know, big city, 190,000 people live there. Right. And, and it is incredibly rare to just be able to have a boat permanently in your backyard and go to the Gulf of Mexico. If you were to be on the East Coast, there's very few lots available. On this side, we tend to have uh, plenty of options. Can you talk to us about kind of what you're seeing as far as a demographic shift and kind of what makes Cape Coral special from that perspective? Well, Cape Coral, you've got New York, New Jersey are, have always had a big footprint here. Yep. You've got uh, a lot of Germans. Uh, I, at one point, was the uh, manager for a German-based, uh, more like director of operations, uh, a German-based real estate brokerage. And it really hit me. Every, every German knew where Cape Coral was. Most of them didn't know where Fort Myers was. And they flew into right. Fort Myers. Yep. You know, so uh, particularly in Europe, Cape Coral is really on the wall and they know where it is. And then you've got another, uh, definitely an inflow uh, of population that are coming here from Dade and Broward. Yes. As they can cash out of, say, Weston for 700000 now, and they can buy a pretty awesome house for two seventy five. dollars So, I, and, you know, you mentioned waterfront. A waterfront on that coast is extremely expensive. Absolutely. Uh, to where you know they can cash out of their three two in a in an HOA community and come over here and buy a saltwater access pool home uh, for in some cases half the price. 
And thanks to uh, we really got behind remote working, uh, we're seeing a lot more. Steelbridge on the uh, traditional brokerage side, I'm seeing a lot more people that are, we had a guy ping us this weekend over a rental we have listed that is going to move here from Orlando because he can work remotely. It's a, it's a given in his company. And, you know, they don't have to fight with I-4 here. I mean, even even on its worst day, I-90 or I-75 on its worst day can't compete with I-4 at two o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, there's absolutely. a lot of benefits to uh, being here versus being somewhere particularly that's congested and actually much more expensive. Absolutely. And I, I agree with that. And one of the things that makes Cape Coral so unique is just the water. We have the uh, mouth of the Cluzahatcha River flowing through the southern end of, of Cape Coral. And then you have the Gulf of Mexico to the western front. Now, a lot of times we'll hear people talk about the difference between salt water and fresh water. Can you kind of um, separate the two and kind of tell us what the benefits are of each of them? Well, the fresh water, you're not you're not going to access the river. You're not going to access the Gulf. It's, it's a closed system. Uh, there's some really cool freshwater canals. There's some pretty amazing bass fishing on some freshwater canals. Uh, you can, there's some big lakes. Some of them lead to like, you can lead to Lake Kennedy. Some yep. of them, I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do. I wouldn't overlook the freshwater. Freshwater are very cheap right now, mm -hmm. primarily because uh, seawalls, seawalls right. become an issue, but it's kind of created a, buying opportunity as well. Uh, I have a partnership where we acquire land and sell with the builders. Sometimes we'll spec a house on it too. And I can acquire freshwater lots right now for cheaper than I can acquire a dry lot because everybody is so uncertain about right. the, uh, the, the seawall code changes. Now, right. saltwater, it's all over the board. You have a really good friend of mine bought a house that was one of the guys from Godsmack built it, the rock band in the cave. Right. It was a pretty cool house. And this house, the pool area looked like, uh, looked like, uh, looked like something uh, the guy from somebody from Godsmack would have built. It was, right. the pool area is pretty awesome. Uh, but it was Southwest Cape, which is a really nice neighborhood. But if you track the bridges to get out, he was 30 minutes to open water. Right. So one of the things in, with salt water is you really need to understand if, if there's bridges, mm -hmm. how high the bridges are. If you see the terms uh, sailboat access, that generally means open, no bridges right. to open water. It right. doesn't mean you're going to fit a huge sailboat down the canal as well, mm -hmm. though. You need to still understand, you know, how deep the canal is. You know, th 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 there's a lot more modalities than just that. But right. one of the main things in the Cape to pay attention to is how far you are to open water. And there's some, and in particularly what open water, if you're like me, when I go out on my boat, I live in North Fort Myers right off the river. I'm either on my boat playing in the river or we all tow them, uh, trailer them to uh, the tip of uh, Pine Island, Boquilia. And then we yeah. go play around Pine Island Sound and go to Gasparilla and stuff like that. So it's, uh, you know, and, and so if that's your, if that's what you're there to do, and that's the most important question you have to ask yourself is right. what are we here to do when yep. you're buying a home or anything? And, you know, if, particularly if you're a fisherman and Pine Island's important to you, then probably the Northwest Cape is a better option than the Southwest Cape. If you're really wanting to take your boat and go to the sandbar parties and uh, anchor off the Lani Kai and just have a good time, then, you know, South Cape's great for you. Right. So. It, it, you know, but you really got to define what you're there to do. Uh, what's awesome with the freshwater, just to get back on that asset class, a lot of wildlife in there. Yep. So, and, and there is some amazing bass fishing on those canals. So, you know, you can, you can fish well, uh, water ski. There's a lot you can do or else just kayak. Like we have, my running joke is I own seven boats, but six of them are kayaks that you have to paddle. Oh. It makes me feel like I've done better in life that I have seven boats. But, you know, like well, me and my wife, if we get early, uh, get an early out at the office, which is pretty rare in today's real estate market, we'll just jump on our kayaks, kayak out to the mouth of the river, watch the sun go down. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Right. So there's a lot you can do. Uh, paddle boarding. There's a lot of paddle boarding that happens on those two. Everybody always asks about alligators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They do. I actually go hunting in the Everglades. I grew up in Florida. I've been all over the Everglades. And generally, unless it's been fed, which is a bad thing, if an alligator sees you, they leave. They're, they're, they have a natural fear of humans. 
but it always comes up about about alligators. It's actually pretty funny. You get to the point after you lived here a few years, you'll see an alligator and you won't even notice it. It's it won't make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, they they stick themselves definitely. So to to recap, the salt water versus fresh water. We're not often talking about the actual salt in the water. We're talking about golf access most of the times. And in which if you're looking for golf access, you should be a fisherman. You should look to access the golf. And which the other questions are then how many bridges, uh, the height of those bridges, and really the amount of time it takes to get to open water. If you are on a freshwater canal, that is not a reason to say that you have a lesser property. It just means we're looking to have different usage in which we're often looking at kayaking. Uh, we often think about just water access as being canals. There's also a number of lakes that are available in which a lake can be perfectly fine. And you also create a barrier between you and the property behind you where it creates an overall sense of peacefulness and a sense of just being in a unique speck of land that is all yours and you are more intertwined with nature. So I'm most of my morning is uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and that's one of the things we didn't cover here is just how important the direction of your backyard is. But yeah. a lot of people, whether you're a sunrise person or a sunset person, or you want the sun to be there all day, the uh, the, the the facing of your back property is very important to a lot of residents here. Yeah, I actually have my morning coffee sitting on my boat dock. So every morning I get up, make a cup of coffee, walk out back, survey my universe, see if there, we actually bought a crab trap on uh, Amazon. So, you know, once in a while, <laughs> it's, a crab, it's a pretty exciting morning if you got a blue crab in the trap. So uh, there's something to be said for living on the water. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it makes this part of the country so unique compared to everyone else. Not only that we have the water, but that we have access to it really any day of the week. Um, one of the things that I get asked very often um, is the assessments with regards to the property. Uh, Jeff, can you talk about when people bring up assessments with Cape Coral properties, what do they mean by that? Well, when they begin to run water and sewer and then irrigation as well sometimes, yep. uh, there's assessments. Now, there's an upside and a downside. The downside is you are going to have assessments. They amortize them over 20 years and put them on the tax bill. At and, and, and to be clear, when we're saying assessments, we're saying the city of Cape Coral is going to give you a, a fee to then pay back having water access to your property. That's both sewer and drinking water. Yeah, and they amortize it over 20 years on the tax yep. bill, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the downside is you have that. Another downside, when they run it, they tear up the roads. You basically yeah. stop washing your car for about a month. You're not yeah. going to keep it clean. Right. Uh, the, uh, now, here's the upside. Now, if you built before that, you've got a uh, septic tank and a well. While your water, you don't have a water bill, uh, you still have to maintain it. You still have to have a softener. When a septic tank has a problem, it tends to be expensive. I mean, you may get lucky and just have to have a clean out, you know, 350. But if you have an issue with your septic tank, it becomes a very expensive issue, particularly if it's an older home. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have a floor now that when you're hooked up to city water and city sewer, uh, if something bad happens, it's not nearly as expensive. So right. we have landlords in the Southwest Florida area that won't buy a rental property that's on a well or a septic tank just because if the septic tank goes bad and they have to replace it, you're about $9,500 right now for new septic right. tank. Yep. So that pretty much eats up the whole year's worth of rent in some cases, much alone, the, you know, it definitely eats up a couple of years worth of positive cash flow. But so in it, it they also have uh, irrigation uh, that comes in as well. So, yeah. and, and there's a, a, it's, I think it's capeims.com. If you go to the Lee County property appraiser site, there's a link to check Cape Coral fees. So say you're looking at a house or say you're looking at a lot, you can just search that address and hit the button run uh, loan payoff. And it'll give you a guesstimate on what the assessments are. Because right. that's one of our primary things. Uh, we have a partnership where we buy and sell 10 to 30 lots a month. Yeah. And uh, that's our first underwrite on a Cape Coral asset, of uh, a Cape Coral lot particularly, is you know, how much in assessments does it have? But yeah. it's not the end of the world. 
it, it's going to raise, there's two things in real estate. There's the cost to acquire it. And then there's the cost to keep it. It's mm -hmm. going to raise your cost to keep, but particularly, uh, and it, here's a, here's an investment opportunity. Initially, right. When the assessments show up, and it's all done in areas, there's like North One, North Two, North Three, SW yeah. Five and Six. And, and it's worth mentioning that basically everything south of Pine Island Road has already been built out. Right now, we're talking about the area just north of Pine Island Road, and then even beyond that, that's going to be maybe six or seven years before that even comes into the picture. Yeah, but the uh, the assessments aren't the end of the world, but you need to know about them. But I mean, uh, just an interesting opportunity I've watched happen time and time again. When they run a fresh batch of assessments, a lot of landowners panic and yeah. blow out and blow their lots out. And you think about it: if you're a builder, you've got an area with water and sewer. So you know, right now, if you build a house with a septic tank, you have to get a permit from the health department, and that takes a little bit—six yeah. weeks. So if you're hooking up the water and sewer, it's easier to build, it's cheaper to build, and you have cheap land. Right. So builders love those areas. Like, and and usually the if you watch statistically, they will take a hit the first year. Yep. And within the second year, they're back to where they started or above it. Right. So, and and that, that brings up a good point where if there's a property that's maybe valued at 220 or so, when the assessments are due, when the construction begins, they're likely to sell for up to 180 just because of the fear. And it might just be a six month period of time, but that, during that time period, there's gonna be a lot of panic and which it can be an opportunity to buy a price, buy a property that is currently undervalued. It may only cost you maybe sixteen thousand dollars or so over the next. You said fifteen to twenty years. Twenty years, right? So it, it really becomes something that you just work into your equation. But that fear, that panic, does be does present a buying opportunity. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. It can. Uh, I, I have personally made money off of it. I will share that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you are an experienced investor. So if you are someone who's looking to become an experienced investor, it makes sense to see what others are doing and possibly follow suit. Another common question that we get, particularly from Northerners, from New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, et cetera, is school choice. And I often work with buyers that are out of state and they'll ask, hey, Alvin, you know, I want to make sure we buy a property that's in a really good school district. I want to make sure my kids go to a great school. And I have to explain to them that in uh, Lee County, we have what's called school choice. And that means that you're not guaranteed to have a kid go to a certain school. Instead, you have a chance to essentially um, add a list of schools that you want your kid to go to. And then based on a lottery system, Basically, that will determine where your school is. Um, Jeff, what has been your experience and uh, pros and cons of school choice overall? Well, I can tell you in 07, I uh, started doing some stuff in Columbus, Ohio, and it really yeah. took me back there. The old school, you know, if you live in this neighborhood, you go to this school. So if it has a really good school, then, you know, if it's an A-plus school, then you know, the houses actually cost a lot more yeah. as opposed to somewhere with, a, with struggling schools. Lee County, I, all three of my children graduated from uh, uh, Lee County schools and yep. uh, got a great education. Mm -hmm. And the one interesting thing that they've done with school choice, each school has some sort of an identity. Yeah. So uh, like even at Island Coast, they have a tilapia farm, mm -hmm. believe it or not, which is cool. I bought the tilapia as a friend of mine's, uh, I call it my, one of my bonus sons was there. So uh, I'd buy 10 pounds of tilapia every year to make sure the program kept going. Right. Uh, each school has a particular focus. Like North Fort Myers High has a, a heavy art focus. Yep. Uh, my kids went to uh, North Academy of the Arts, which is kind of an art school, but it, it was a great school. I mean, I'm probably not supposed to say that, but it's, it's my experience. But each school has its own focus. So you really want to figure out, you know, you're going to get, you're going to be in this zone. You're going to be in that zone. And then you really want to visit the schools and figure out which one is a fit. Uh, because, you know, certain schools have an engineering program. Some schools don't have an engineering program. It just really depends on what they want to do. Uh, some schools have a heavy focus on like the band. Some just kind of have a band. So in each school has its own particular, I don't know, feel for it, its own vibe too. So you really want to check yeah. them out. 
Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. They have their own culture. Some might emphasize the sports or arts differently. And to your point, it, it, that sense of competition also creates a separation amongst the school. And they all kind of carve out their own niche as opposed to having a mandate. It also becomes very clear as to what some of the best schools are. And it doesn't limit you based on where you buy a property on your kid's ability to go to a great school. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's really, the, if you're a parent, go check the schools out. Go visit them, meet the principal, figure out what, uh, every school has a very particular focus. So you can kind of figure it out that, hey, this is what they do, uh, do well. Like my kids went to North Fort Myers High and they have a really awesome uh, audio visual program, uh, particularly if say a kid has interest in journalism. Uh, while all the schools have that, they had a pretty good program for it. There's just a lot of, it's really, it's, it, it's choice for a reason. And even the schools have kind of made choices on, on what they're after. So it, it can be a little intimidating and a little overwhelming because you got to make a decision. So it's almost easier when you don't have school choice. You just live here and you go. <laughs> so, you know, if there's not enough decisions to be made in this world, it does create more decisions. And, you know, and I also would not go on Facebook and ask a bunch of people because you generally are only going to get the negativity for the right. most part on social media. Uh, the complainers tend to drown it out, you know, and particularly you go into, there's some Cape Coral Forum groups that are pretty awesome for recommendations, yeah. but you, uh, you also are going to get, uh, you know, 99 people had a good experience. One person had a bad, you're probably going to hear about the one person. They're, they're, they're a lot more uh, vocal. So I would tell you, make your own decisions, go meet, go to school, check it out. But school choices. Uh, I have friends that have three kids in high school. Uh, one just graduated and each kid went to a different high school. Yep. So and it cause it, it actually fit what the kid was doing. Right. And I think the middle kid just didn't want to go where his brother <laughs> So, you know, he had to be his own which that's, a, which that's a major benefit, right, is that you have the option to decide uh, what school is best for each of the kids you may have. One of the other common questions we get from others, particularly with outside of the state of Florida, is when it comes to flood insurance. And even when it comes to working with investors, a lot of times they want to figure out all of their costs. And they want to figure out, hey, does investing in Southwest Florida make sense? And then it gets to the point where it's very property specific as to which plot of land or which property requires flood insurance, which one and which one doesn't. Can you talk more about that? Well, you've got basic flood codes. Uh, flood zone X, you don't have to have flood insurance. Like yep. when we're looking for lots for builders, they overwhelmingly want flood zone X. Well, it makes sense. Uh, there's a flood zone AE which I had a house, uh, I wasn't even on the water, but uh, I had a house in North Fort Myers on uh, a little over an acre that we were AE and I think my fund insurance was like $400 a year. Right. It wasn't the end of the world. I live on the water now and it's not that cheap. No. So you know, I'm on a canal, six houses off the river, but you know, at some point you got to live a little bit too. Yep. So, and then the most important thing with flood insurance, if you're in a flood zone uh, by codes, Anything 85 and older is going to have a higher flood insurance premium because of uh, the elevation that the house, uh, every time we have a code change, we kind of require the houses to be a little higher. It's almost like the fill dirt guys have a lot of, uh, a lot of input into our, uh, our building, but they're going to come out and they're going to do what's called an elevation certificate. Your surveyor will. Yep. And here's the thing. If you don't have an elevation certificate, your flood quote will be off the highest potential it can be, the highest uh, premium uh, it can be. That's why that elevation certificate is so critical. It's almost if you're buying a house, particularly 90 and older, but particularly 85 and older, part of your due diligence is probably go get an elevation certificate. Right. It's going to dictate a lot of what you do, which this is one of the reasons why you see so many teardowns in the Yacht Club area. Absolutely. Uh, because, I mean, they're awesome lots, it's great water access, it's an awesome place. But you also have, you know, some of these things were built in the 70s and the elevation certificate makes the uh, flood insurance problematic. Yeah, and, and you know, even I'm a little bit north on Pine Island, on, on, on Pelican Boulevard, 
And I'm not technically on a flood zone, but everything around me is, has mandatory flood insurance. And it's pretty cheap to get, and you should get it anyway. Uh, really all of Florida is subject to flooding. <laughs> right? you're, you're, yeah. you're not gonna not have risk. But for me, the way I look at it is I spend about $500 a year in flood insurance. And probably in the next 10 years, I will use it at least once. And so that one time I do use it makes up for all the other times. Yeah, it's really, again, you need to know what you're doing. And in, you know, if you're going to, like, I have an older home in a flood area, but I got a really awesome deal, so I'm okay with it. Right. Yeah. Plus, I love the house. We, we really do. Our joke, we tolerate our house. We love our backyard. So, but me and my <laughs> wife are at the point in life where we're in the backyard in the pool going boating. You know, we have a guest house uh, kind of off the pool. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. But, you know, we knew what we were getting into. What you don't want to do is buy something and not know what you're getting into. So right. if you're working with a real estate agent, uh, one of the first things your agent should be asking you is a flood insurance. And particularly if you're getting a mortgage, it's part of your payment. Yep. So it, and, and, you know, it can go up and they can change flood maps. Uh, there was a recent, uh, they call them the firm maps, the flood maps. There was a recent change in downtown Fort Myers where, a couple of commercial buildings, they basically moved it over a block. Yep. And it brought some commercial buildings into it that previously didn't require flood insurance. Right. And ironically enough, it's a very historic building was under contract to sell. And in the process of that contract, it being in a flood zone killed the deal. Yeah. So you really, and that's another thing too, you want to kind of keep up with if they're going to change the flood maps, because it's the federal government that puts these maps out. They do long-term right. studies and they put these maps out. So because you're not in a flood zone today, doesn't mean you can't be tomorrow. So right. just something to factor in, but it's really simple, particularly if you're working with a real estate agent, we click a button in the MLS, a uh, real list comes up, it's right there. It's very right. easy to find. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really easy for an experienced real estate agent to figure out whether or not you are in a flood zone. And you can even reach out to an insurance broker and figure out what the costs are for getting flood insurance, hurricane insurance, all the other insurances for a property before you close on that property. So to your point, the key is to get the information, work with someone who will get that information for you, compile it and run the numbers and see whether or not that still makes sense. There is a price to pay for living in paradise, and that, and that can be one of them. One of the things that, and I, and I personally feel like there's a misconception between developers and burrowing owls. I, I think personally, most people absolutely love burrowing owls. We just have to learn how to coexist with them. Uh, as a developer and someone who regularly acquires um, lots and properties, kind of what's your relationship with burrowing owls? Well, me personally, <laughs> I run when I see a burrowing owl or a gopher tortoise because yeah. it's something I can't control. Yeah. So uh, that part of that Cape IMS site is if there's property restrictions, if it's on their radar, you hit a button and it tells you it's there. Yep. Uh, that is a big thing to pay attention if you're buying uh, because you have a lot of out-of-state buyers that will list a property or agents that will list a property for an out-of-state seller and then sell it to an out-of-state buyer and the buyer is not aware uh, that those environmental issues are there. Uh, the owls, there's certain times that when they're nesting that they can't be uh, encumbered. There's also, there's times you can build a house with an owl on the lot depending yeah. upon how the floor plan and how this and that is. That is really a question for a biologist. That'd be an awesome video, actually, to do. <laughs> well, there's so much misconceptions well, yeah. about yeah. it, and so few actually know it. Like, you can relocate gopher tortoises. Yeah. It's a fee, and there are certain times that it has to be done, but there's more misconceptions about it. And it's not the end of the world, but it, buying a lot with either a burrowing owl or tortoises on it, it's not the end of the world. It is some brain damage, and it's probably going to cost you a little bit of money in, at some point to uh, do it. Yeah, and, and that's a valid point. And one of the things you'll see if you drive around Cape Coral, you'll see stakes in the ground and you'll see a hole in the floor. And it, oftentimes you see an owl popping out. That's uh, classified by the Cape Coral Friends Wildlife as a protected area for, for those owls in which that's when we start having those kind of conflicts between a developer, not, not, I shouldn't say conflicts. 
that's when we start having the education right? <laughs> of, of how to properly build, how do we properly maximize the benefits of a lot while the owls still exist there. And it should be noted that the nesting season is officially between uh, February 15th and July 10th. Uh, there are several rules and guidelines to how to properly work alongside of the burling owls. And they do do a lot to, I guess, add to the attractiveness of Cape Coral overall. In fact, they are bus tours where you can get on a bus and drive around Cape Coral mm -hmm. and see the different sites. There's tons of YouTube videos and channels of people flying in from out of state just to observe the, the mm -hmm. natural behaviors of the burling owls. There is a great deal of benefits that the owls provide. But to your point, it is something you want to make sure if you're buying a lot that you understand the complications that can arise from having a burling owl on site. We, I can tell you, I've even had, we were part of a big package of lots that we acquired in 12, 2012. Yep. We were trying, one guy was trying to buy them all and he's trying to, now bear in mind, we drove every lot a week before we bought them, make sure yep. there's nothing popped up. Two weeks later, this guy's trying to tell me there's there, there's owls and tortoises on every lot. And so if if you're a seller or a you know just a landowner and people are calling you, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people will try and tell you you have owls or tell you you have tortoises and you may not just right. trying to justify a uh, low offer on the land. So if somebody calls you on the phone and tells you they want to buy your lot and then they say they're bar they only buy lots with burrowing owls. I've encountered people that have gotten these and then the out of state owner panics and blows it out and come to find out there's no owls there. So you right. definitely, you definitely want to check it in, but then it's used. Uh, it's a good thing that we protect them. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's also like every good thing. There's also some, some kind of bad uses for it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do I think due that, diligence. If you own the land, uh, if somebody's telling you you got owls, the city should have a record of it. But more importantly, you need to lay your eyes or have somebody lay their eyes on the lot. Absolutely. And I think you bring up a number of points. I think to summarize our conversations today is that Cape Coral is an absolutely incredible place to live, to invest, and to have a family, go to school, all that fun stuff. But it is a very unique place. As intertwined with nature is, has a lot of the benefits with regards to the waterways, has some things with regards to the owls that you should be made aware of. You have to be aware of all the insurance complications behind it. And the key is, is to educate yourself and to work with people who are very educated in doing investments and buying and selling in the area. Uh, obviously, I'm a real estate investor and a realtor. So obviously I have these uh, talents and these skills. Uh, Jeff, as the president of the Southwest Florida Rio, can you kind of end today's meeting just kind of talking about some of the ways that uh, your future members can benefit from learning about the region from the group? Well, here's the awesome part about a Rio meeting. It's uh, we don't do information product sales. So a lot of the real estate investing focused meetings, uh, they're always going to at the end try and sell you a $5,000 weekend uh, from people that may or may not actually do real estate for a living. There's some of it, it's just information product sales, to be honest. Yep. Uh, we don't do that. It's very what I call intrinsically focused, uh, the group. You've got a lot of people trying to figure out how to do the first deal uh, sitting next to a guy who owns 335 properties who pretty freely shares. So uh, it's a great group. Collectively, the membership's about 4,000 properties owned. We actually, uh, it's a metric that we track when people join. Uh, the assistant starts running names and LLCs. Just to, So there, there's a lot of experience. It's a very collaborative environment. Uh, I always kind of call it everybody kind of ceases fire for, you know, the meeting. And we're all competitors for the most part out in the field. But at the meeting, everybody's right. pretty, pretty decent. And uh, there are no secrets. There really are no secrets for sale. Uh, there's experiences that other people can share with you that'll, that'll, that'll cut short your learning curve. Yeah. The problem with real estate investing, any type of investing, when you're investing your own money, that learning curve sometimes comes at the uh, expense of your uh, balance sheet. So it's really important to be able to, uh, like I've, I've had some amazing mentors in my life that have just came out of nowhere on top of that. And uh, I, 
I was talking to one of my mentors about a deal I was about to do, and his exact words were me too. All the scar tissue on my back is tingling right now with what you're saying. I did what you did 20 years ago, and it only took me a couple months to recover, is what right. he said. So, you know, it's and and that's really what we do at the RIA as well. It's very, very I mean, you and I would freely share and we didn't work together. And we're Absolutely. real estate agents. So it was, you know, that's that's pretty rare in this world too. Usually you're, you know, covering your back trail a little bit more professionally. But the uh when it comes to uh that group, I really it's you know, I founded it, so it's kind of my passion. But it's it's a great group, particularly if you're just curious about uh real estate, real estate investing. If you're a new agent, it's a great place. Uh if you're a contractor trying to get business, you're in a room full of people buying and selling property and landlords. I mean, it's a great place to get business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, one of the benefits is that you're alongside the same people who think the same way as you do. So your ability to sharpen your skills, to understand what other investors are looking to buy, to be able to meet with people who are buying the same class of uh, properties that you are, and to really sharpen your skills is absolutely incredible. Uh, I do want to thank you for your time today. You've been absolutely incredible and generous with your time. I really did learn a lot during this conversation. Uh, if you want to know more about how to work with Jeff or myself, I'll include some links in the bottom. Uh, Jeff, do you want to say goodbye to our crowd today? Thanks. Enjoy <laughs> it, <man. laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And take care, guys.